to the wall so as not to uh, not to breathe at anyone. Hey, welcome. Uh, since we got people watching, so I'm uh, Jeff, um, Jeff Hazlitt, is Associate Director of the Kindred Institute of Constitutional Democracy, and we are so glad to be back in person again here at the fourth floor of Jesse Hall with our cloakroom series, uh, sponsored by Logboat Brewing, uh, and stay tuned for Pursuit of Happiness Hour afterwards. Uh, so let's thank you. Thank, thank you to Logboat and thank you everybody for for uh, who's been attending all the online things and hopefully we can safely get back to to what we like to think of as re as real life again here soon in the process. Um, before I introduce Antwiti, uh today's speaker, I wanted to just do a couple of uh, coming attractions. Uh, next week uh, we'll is we will not be doing this up here. The uh, True False Film Festival in Columbia is also making its in-person comeback, or its in-person indoor comeback, I guess, because it had like this outdoor thing last year, which was, you know, it was, it was a noble effort, but uh, 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 watching documentaries on giant balloons in the rain uh, was, 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 was not the top experience, perhaps, but uh, uh, Next week we're doing they're doing it for real and we as as we have for the last one years sponsoring the film uh, and I believe it's one there's still tickets for available it is Mr. Lance Burgess uh, a film by a, uh, a program led by a Ukrainian filmmaker uh, Sergei Loznitsa about the uh, it is the most thorough documentary you will ever see about the Lithuanian Revolution in 1990. Maybe I shouldn't reveal it's really good. It's really comprehensive. It's extremely educational. It's on at uh, ten o'clock. Ten o'clock uh, on Sunday or one o'clock on Saturday, and you can go, go to True Balls and buy those tickets. Uh, I would uh, wear comfortable pants uh, <laughs> because it's, it's pretty comprehensive. I won't say how long, but uh, uh, it's you'll you'll, uh, it's, you'll you'll feel that you've invested in your own education in the cause of constitutional democracy uh, and, and in a way that, uh, you know, on the, what appears to be on the other end of a certain historical period that we may be, uh, the, uh, of the end of, end of an epic that we may be coming to a new new phase of now. So it's actually quite timely, though maybe more optimistic about things when you're feeling currently. So I don't know how well I feel. So Mr. Lansbury, uh, uh, next next weekend. Uh, then. Following that, the next colloquium we'll be having, uh, there's a bunch of stuff in March, but the next one we're having would be uh, Chris Grasso, Chris Grasso Brown University, who will be doing actually a uh, Missouri related topic, a teacher, preacher, soldier, spy, the civil wars of John R. Kelso, who's this sort of preacher, spy, marriage experimenter dude, uh, who's uh, I'd actually not heard of, but. It actually should be should be extremely uh, those who are interested in Missouri history, Civil War history. Uh, it should actually be uh, very educational. But back to uh, and then there's a whole bunch more stuff coming in March, which I which I won't go into. Uh, let's go to today's uh, speak today's talk though, uh, where we're very pleased to have uh, in Professor Ian Twitty, who is our associate professor of, of history at University of Mississippi back. In, in another phase of life, uh, uh, but we're glad to have had her here this year as our distinguished visiting uh, visiting professor in legal history here at the Kinder Institute. And a lot of you have been taking your classes, and uh, we've been so glad to have Annie here this year, where uh, she's uh, also been starting this new project she's going to talk about today. Uh, she's actually, I think, going to mention her book after uh, after Dred Scott. Uh, that's that's her major book on uh, slavery in Missouri and freedom suits uh, that, she'll, that she'll talk about. Uh, another one that you may not know about, uh, in fact, I guess this is probably, I knew that, I knew in any way, I don't remember exactly with all the vector, well, I remember one major vector, obviously. But, but uh, I think one of the, Andy's a like sixth generation Missourian, so it wasn't her first time in Columbia, but she came to Columbia about two years ago, I guess three now, exactly three now. Uh, for the Missouri Crisis Conference we had uh, in February 2019 on the 
bicentennial of the Talmadge Amendment, and uh, out of that came uh, uh, a uh, that came a chapter in the book that we just published, or book one of the two books we just published uh, on the uh, uh, Missouri bicentennial, the uh, Fire Bell and Past, Ames in Volume One, Western Slavery National Impasse, uh, that I edited with uh, John Craig Hammond in Annie's chapter, which is one of the great ones in the book, is mitigating freedom. During the Missouri crisis, I certainly recommend that and all everything in this, of course, everything in uh, this <laughs> wonderful book and its companion, uh, uh, which uh, you can, uh, of course, uh, get from the University of Missouri Press. And or am I even selling one right now? Uh, uh, but Annie's going to tell talk, talk to us today about her new project where it's really innovative. Uh, it could be one of those things that you know you heard it here first. Uh, uh, you heard it here first that ratification might not be. I don't know, we'll see. Or, or, or we only decided it was a thing later. Uh, but I think I will stop there because I've been having a long week. And I don't know <laughs> what else might come out of my mouth. So I'll turn it over to Professor Ann Quitty. Make sure I get my mic on there. Um, Thank you, uh, Jeff, for that introduction, and um, thank you to all of you for, for turning out. Obviously, there is a lot going on uh, in the world right now, and so I appreciate you taking some time on this very cold Friday afternoon to, to spend some time um, with me hearing about this new project. Um, and I'm very much excited to present this work. This work, uh, as Jeff alluded to, is quite a bit of a departure um, from my earlier interests and expertise. Uh, my first book is called The Ford Red Scott, Slavery and Liberal Culture in the American Confluence. And it considers a collection of freedom suits that was filed by enslaved people in St. Louis and what it can tell us about legal culture um, writ large. For the last decade or so, my real emphasis has been on the history of American slavery and the intersection of that history with the history of American law. Now, the work that I'm going to be presenting today did, in fact, grow out of my teaching. I feel like that's something uh, that scholars probably don't talk about enough. And it specifically grew out of a lecture that I gave every single fall and some springs as well while I was teaching the first half of the American History Survey. Each semester that I taught this course, I spent considerable time laying out the varieties of governmental plans that Americans were embracing. Uh, both at the state and the federal level, both during and after the American Revolution. Year after year, for close to a decade, I relayed a set of events that created a clear overarching narrative. In an age of constitutional innovation and experimentation, I told my students, the ratification of the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 constituted a great leap forward. The Philadelphia Convention then appropriated this groundbreaking practice for the federal constitution. And ever since, ratification has been understood as a central and altogether necessary feature of any legitimate American constitution. In short, the story that I told my students over and over again, semester after semester was, Massachusetts devises the solution through ratification, Ratification is then appropriated in the federal constitution, and subsequently ratification becomes the American way. I assume that this is perhaps a familiar narrative to many of you, perhaps most of you. Maybe you too have spent a decade or more repeating this general story to generations of undergraduate students. Unfortunately, as it turns out, there's only one problem with this story. As I'm going to try to convince you today, it simply isn't true. So I first started to question this oft-repeated narrative while working on the volume that Jeff actually mentioned. This volume here, Firebell in the Past. I was invited to come to the University of Missouri to present some work, and out of that presentation grew an essay that became part of this edited collection. My task in that particular essay was to consider how, if at all, one enslaved woman's freedom suits and the freedom suits of her children were shaped by the Missouri crisis, which unfolded alongside her legal efforts. The essay attempts to narrate these two intertwined developments, and in compiling the timeline of events, it dawned on me that, in fact, Missouri's eventual 1820 constitution 
was never put to a vote of the people. It was instead adopted in convention and then approved after some additional wrangling uh, from Congress and then implemented as the supreme law of the state. This fact nagged me at the time, but on deadline, knowing full well that this was far beyond the scope of the essay that I was actually writing, I put this detail to the side. I pushed it out of my mind. The next time I taught the survey, however, and prepared to repeat that same old story, I decided I needed to try to reconcile what I had been telling my students time after time about how ratification had come to be seen as one of, if not the fundamental markers of a legitimate constitution with what I had just learned about the constitutional process as it unfolded during the Missouri crisis. What I discovered left me deeply confused about why I ever started telling that story in the first place. So it turns out that between 1780 and 1860, right, when 1780, the, the, the date that Massachusetts uh, embraces ratification in its constitution, and 1860, of course, being the eve of the American Civil War, in this period, there are at least 48 state constitutions adopted in the United States. And I say at least because there is an entirely separate but related project uh, that could be written about how difficult sometimes it can be to determine whether or not some projects are in fact new constitutions or merely a set of extensive revisions and amendments to existing constitutions. Many of these state constitutions, of course, were constitutions like Missouri's uh, that were created for and in brand new states, and I've marked those with an asterisk. The overwhelming majority, however, of the constitutions written during this period of time were constitutions written to replace old constitutions in existing states. So how many of these constitutions were ratified, like Massachusetts? How many were not ratified, like Missouri? The answer, I think, is going to surprise you. Only the constitutions listed in red were ratified by any kind of process that I think we would recognize as ratification today. And there's a whole lot of additional complexities that I can get into there. Of these 48 state constitutions adopted between 1780 and 1860, not a single one was ratified uh, between 1784 and 1818. And indeed, up until the mid-1830s, ratification was the exception, not the rule. What happened in Missouri in the aftermath of the Missouri crisis, it was clear, was not some kind of aberration. When I learned this, of course, like any neurotic academic, I became convinced that this was all my fault, right? This wasn't my area of expertise after all. Probably I just read something and I misunderstood it. And then I just kept saying it, right? Like the song that never ends, right? I started singing it, not knowing what it was, and then I continued, if not forever, over and over again for about a decade. But it also seemed like such a weird idea for me to have just pulled out of the air, right? And that turns out to be because it wasn't a story that I just invented. In fact, the story that I've been repeating, a story again that I hope is, is familiar to you, otherwise I don't truly believe that I've lost my mind, had been one that was repeated over and over again by some of the most prominent scholars of American law, politics, and constitutionalism. Um, and I want to give you a sense of, of, of how sort of vast and broad this narrative really is in some of those works. Most of these figures probably aren't going to need a lot of introduction to the people sitting in this room. So first, uh, Gordon Wood in Liberty and Power. This Massachusetts experience set the proper pattern of constitution making and constitution altering. Constitutions were created or changed by specially elected conventions and then placed before the people for ratification. Conventions and the process of ratification made the people the actual constituent power. We have Jack Rakoff and revolutionaries. In Massachusetts, popular consent meant subsequent ratification, and that's his emphasis actually, not mine, of a document framed by a body called for that purpose alone. This innovation had profound consequences. It made it possible to distinguish the supreme law of a constitution from all the other legal actions the government it created would be to take. So those are two examples. Here's two more. James Lord Hurst, largely considered to be kind of the father of American legal history in his 1950 book, The Growth of American Law, the overwhelming weight of practice involved 
the submission of the product of the convention to the voters. The submission of the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 seems to have been in response to genuine popular feeling. This set the later pattern and the Jacksonian trend to put more and more power directly in the voters reinforced this practice. And we have Sean Lawrence in the rise of American democracy. The Berkshire men who had protested Massachusetts' early form of government between 1775 and 1780 did, however, establish the proposition that any new American constitution required popular approval. Now, lest you think that this is confined to monographs, uh, let me tell you that it's also made its way into a number of popular American history textbooks. And I should note here that most American history textbooks actually don't mention the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780. Uh, those that do tend to be those uh, textbooks that are written with colonialists whose interests are specifically at the intersection of constitutionalism, law, and politics. So, for instance, in Liberty, Equality, Power, where the prime uh, uh, colonialist here is uh, John Murren, we have during the spring of 1780, town meetings began the ratification process. The new constitution promptly went into effect, and though this often been amended, is still enforced today, making it the world's oldest constitution in the world. Starting with New Hampshire in 1784, other states adopted the Massachusetts model. And finally, and I promise this is the last example, uh, we have visions of America where the lead colonialist here is Saul Cornell. A special convention drafted the Massachusetts Constitution, which it then submitted directly to the people for ratification. The notion that a constitution had to be submitted to the people for ratification was a radical innovation that quickly became an accepted part of American life. Now, in addition to these examples, let me just other, uh, we're going to say that there are other folks uh, who write in such a way that they kind of edge right up to this narrative without necessarily crossing that line. That's certainly true for Pauline Mayer's ratification. It's true for Akhil Mars, the words that pay us. I will say that Gordon Wood is a bit cagier on this in his magisterial creation of the American Republic. But of course, it's that book that lays the groundwork um, for so much that, that has followed in its wake. In any case, uh, it's clear that even when scholars don't outright say that this was a new pattern that all states subsequently adopted, they inch right up to it, and it would be very easy to finish reading that portion of their book and walk away thinking that this, in fact, was the correct narrative, right? To think that this was the upshot of what we just uh, actually read. So what then are the reasons that we've missed this story, right? These are some imminent folks. They didn't fall off the turnip truck, right? They have studied and spent their lives thinking about uh, constitutionalism uh, in the United States. I want to suggest a few ideas for why I think we've missed this story. The first suggestion uh, that I want to make is, is probably going to be, a, again, pretty familiar to this particular audience. Generally speaking, there is scholarly disinterest in state constitutions in this particular area, right? Basically, the era from the revolution all the way up until the Civil War, and this is especially true among historians. Political scientists are doing a little bit better uh, than historians in this regard. But generally speaking, just not a lot of interest. There are a handful of exceptions to this sort of general rule. There's been a lot of recent scholarly interest, for instance, in the New York Constitution of 1821 and what it can tell us about questions of black citizenship. But by and large, you just don't find much written on this particular period. You do find historians interested in the first set of American constitutions. You find historians interested in Jim Crow era constitutions. You find historians interested in Confederate constitutions. Just not a lot of interest in this long period, this long kind of mushy middle uh, between the American Revolution and the Civil War. And I think it's telling that the most complete uh, work that's been written recently on this subject um, comes not from a historian, but by a man by the name of Christian Fritz, a legal scholar, right? He works in a law school. Uh, and also, I want to point out that probably the two most useful secondary materials that I used in compiling uh, this presentation were more than 100 years old, right? A treatise written in 1867 called The Treatise on Constitutional Conventions, and a work from 1910 called The Revision and Amendment of State Constitutions. Everybody else basically just mentions these constitutions in this long period for a very brief period of time as part of a much larger work whose emphasis is somewhere else. There are other problems as well. 
the proliferation of siloed histories of state constitutional development. Now, the story of the development and adoption of various state constitutions during this period is frequently told through the lens of state history. What you find when you find anything at all are articles with titles like Making the Vermont Constitution, 1777-1824, or the Mississippi Constitutional Convention of 1832. And because these works are generally presented in isolation, it can be exceedingly difficult to sketch any overarching trends or patterns. Additionally, when we do stumble across instances in which state constitutions were not ratified, like I did when I discovered that Missouri's constitution uh, was not ratified, it seemed far easier to just dismiss this as some kind of weird one-off. Additionally, what we find is the persistence of these passive constructions when narrating constitutional change. Probably you all have encountered some of these phrases, a phrase like, a constitutional convention was called, or my personal favorite, a new constitution was adopted. <laughs> Such language obscures the very processes and mechanisms that actually manifested and made constitutions. And it then becomes much, much easier for us to assume that they simply follow the same constitutional practices that we do today, right? We fill in the blanks with our brains, but we fill it in wrong. But there are other reasons as well. First of all, these, these, these documents themselves, these constitutions, let's say that you decide that you're going to go look at these early national and antebellum constitutions. What you will find is that these constitutions are generally silent on their mechanism for adoption. You know, you're probably all pretty familiar with Article 7 of the United States Constitution, uh, which clearly spells out that ratification will take place, right? What, what needs to happen before the federal constitution is enacted. But if you were, for instance, to go read the Massachusetts or New Hampshire constitutions from 1780 and 1784, you would have no idea from that text that they were in fact ratified. Or I can compare for you uh, the constitutions of South Carolina in 1790 and New York in 1821, they both include these virtually identical statements. One is ratified, one is not. So often, if you want to find out whether or not these documents were ratified by the people, you have to look beyond the documents themselves. Usually, you have to look to um, the state legislatures that gave these conventions their charge, or you have to look in, in other places entirely. It's only in the 1830s, starting with Virginia and Tennessee in 1831 and 1834, that state constitutions start to include this language. That you can actually go look at a state constitution and figure out from the text itself that it was read. In addition to kind of some of these sort of broader problems, I think there's also related uh, questions about how we told two stories. One problem is related to what I'm claiming here is a misreading of why the Massachusetts and New Hampshire constitutions were ratified in the first place. Scholars have assumed that ratification in Massachusetts and to a lesser degree New Hampshire was some kind of grand constitutional commentary on the necessity of ratification. But what I think this work makes plain is that there's something distinctly weird that must have happened in those two states in 1780 and in 1784. First, it's worth underscoring the extent to which New Hampshire simply copies Massachusetts in everything constitutional, not just in the form, but also in the actual substance of the document. So I think New Hampshire's ratification is maybe a bit of a red herring altogether. Second, it's worth underscoring that ratification in these two states is pretty different from the practice that we now associate with ratification. In both of these two states, what we find is towns ratifying uh, these constitutions rather than individuals or conventions doing that work. And I want to suggest that perhaps we should conflate those two different things. Third, Massachusetts, and to some extent the whole of New England, and, and this is probably also going to be familiar to you, had a really long history of this town governance that is distinct from the entirety of the rest of the United States. You cannot find town governance like you find in New England, in Virginia, or South Carolina, or Pennsylvania, any of these other places. So when you put all of this together alongside this finding that other states did not, in fact, ratify their constitutions for many additional decades, 
I think it implies that ratification in these two states was less a commitment to ratification per se, and more maybe a capitulation to this tradition of town deliberation and town approval. People in Massachusetts were not defending the idea of popular ratification, they were defending the Massachusetts tradition of allowing towns to call the shots. And those two things are maybe somewhat similar, but I think they're different. Finally, and probably most importantly, I think there is a misreading of why the federal constitution was ratified itself. This seems to be the biggest issue by far. For most scholars, the punchline of the story of ratification is the ratification of the federal constitution. The argument goes that the document's legal legitimacy was entirely predicated on this fact, on the supreme exercise of popular sovereignty. And ever since, it proved the crucial fact, returned to time and time again to defend the Constitution's ongoing legitimacy. The Constitution, so it goes, was legitimate because we, the people, had approved it through these special lawmaking procedures. The Constitution is the act of the people and not the 55 dudes in Philadelphia, thanks to this American invention known as ratification. Scholars are not wrong that ratification of the federal Constitution was believed to be important. Federalists did indeed attach enormous significance to the ratification of the federal Constitution. Where scholars' error, I think, is in taking an additional step. In believing that Federalists thought that ratification was important not just for the federal constitution, but for any constitution. That it represented the one, the true, the only legitimate way to make a constitution legitimate. To spell this out, most scholars assume that the delegates to the Constitutional Convention submitted the constitution for ratification because Americans had come to believe, thanks to their experience in some of the states, that this was the mechanism by which a constitution was properly enacted. This choice, in other words, supposedly grew from a supposedly like mature understanding of constitutionalism that had been acquired through this experimentation in the states. The assumption is that founding era Americans had come to believe that ratification was essential and that if it was not ratified, it could not be legitimate. This jump, however, I would suggest is not warranted. Just because Federalists thought that the federal constitution had to be ratified did not mean that they believed that all constitutions needed to be ratified. The decision put the federal constitution up for ratification was not an expression of this now established American understanding of how you make a constitution legal and legitimate. We know this in part because of what I've already underscored. None of the state constitutions created immediately after federal ratification were in fact ratified, right? Practice tells us the story here. And in some instances, those constitutions, right, the constitutions embraced immediately after the federal constitution, in some cases, those were shaped by leading federalists. And that's something I'm going to return to a little bit later in today's talk. We also know that this leap isn't warranted because at the Constitutional Convention itself, there were those who opposed ratification. Oliver Ellsworth and Elbert Terry both dismissed Madison's argument that the federal constitution had to be ratified. Right? For them, claiming that the federal constitution had to be ratified implied that the state constitutions were not legitimate if they too had not been ratified. Right? They didn't want to open that can of worms. So the federal constitution was not put up for ratification because it was widely believed that this method and this method alone could make the constitution fully legal. It was put up for ratification for reasons largely particular to the federal constitution. Essentially, ratification of the federal constitution was a practical necessity. As leading federalists recognized, none more clearly than James Madison, the federal constitution stood absolutely no chance if the state legislatures were to determine its fate. They needed to do everything in their power to circumvent the power of existing state legislatures, which were jealous and would not uh, accede to this, this new federal constitution that gave more power um, to the federal government that they had previously enjoyed. Right? So there is this real sense uh, among Madison and, and his peers that what they're doing is for practical reasons, not necessarily for sort of these lofty um, ideological ones. More than this, however, given the dubious legality of the federal constitution, uh, and, and when I talk about the dubious legality of the federal constitution, I'm here alerting to the fact that 
they were sent to Philadelphia to revise the articles. And there's a lot of confusion at the beginning of, of the convention about what exactly they're doing. Are they revising the articles? Are they, in fact, striking out and creating a brand new form of government? Ultimately, right, most of the New York delegation leaves Alexander Hamilton alone because they think that they're engaged in a coup. They think that they vastly exceeded the charge that they were given by the sitting Congress by trying to create a new form of government. Because of this context, right, because there were already vast concerns about the legitimacy of what they were doing, this meant that Federalists emphasized ratification all the more. Right? They needed to pretend as though, you know, if the people were God in America and the people wanted a new constitution, it didn't really matter whether or not they exceeded the charge that they were given by Congress. So again, there were real practical considerations at play here for the folks who advanced uh, ratification as absolutely central to this document. And then finally, there is the vital fact that the Constitution of 1787 was, by definition, a federal constitution. This made some kind of ratification inevitable. Unlike the state constitutional conventions that preceded it, the federal convention could have never realistically drawn upon a constitution and then simply announced that it was now in effect. The states would not have permitted that. They would have insisted upon approving a constitution proposed by a federal convention, and the states, after all, had also approved the Articles of Confederation. Any system that replaced the Articles of Confederation would need to be approved in a similar fashion, unable to simply enact what they had proposed, champions of the 1787 Constitution instead faced the choice of whether or not they would seek the approval from those state legislatures or from the people themselves sitting in conventions. Because of the existing federal system, no other option was available. So, most scholars, I argue, have missed this story. Right? And I've tried to sketch out so far some of the reasons I think they've missed this story. There are, to be sure, a handful of historians who do talk about the kind of demise of ratification for a period. I'm going to skip over this portion of the talk, and if you guys want to ask me anything about that in q and I'd be more than happy to discuss it. To this point, I've sketched out, I think, both a problem and, from my view, it's most likely cause, right, or set of causes, I should say. But if our old narrative has to be thrown out, if we can no longer confidently proclaim that Massachusetts devises the solution, it's appropriated by the federal constitution, and then becomes the American way, if that story is wrong, what story is right? right? What do we put in the vacuum that the absence of that narrative creates? And what can this new history, I'm going to try to sketch out for you in, in the remaining portion of my talk, what can this new history about tell us about constitutionalism in the early national and antebellum eras? To begin to answer this question, I went searching for discussions of ratification. How had those at the time talked about the practice, and how did they explain why so many state constitutions for such a long time abandoned ratification? What became plain was how little discussion of ratification there actually seems to have been around the subject of state constitutions especially those adopted in the immediate aftermath of the federal constitution. This, I think, in and of itself is remarkable and really deserves a lot greater emphasis. What many regard as the essential idea of U.S. constitutionalism was actually all but ignored at the exact time that people, we assume, should have been celebrating it. Instead, when they discussed the mechanism through which a constitution was adopted, by far the primary focus of some of the most significant figures in the era was the importance of having a special convention draft a constitution. It was this drafting body, not some up or down vote, either by townships or by individuals, that was seen as one of the essential ingredients for a legitimate constitution. In June of 1775, for instance, when various colonies began asking the Continental Congress for guidance on creating their own civil governments, John Adams' initial advice was plain. Special conventions, he argued, were the special sauce, right? We had a people of more intelligence, curiosity, and enterprise who must be all consulted that this could only be done by conventions of representatives chosen by the people of the several colonies. 
ask, what do we do to create a civil government in the midst of, of, of a war? I mean, this is supposedly John Adams' famous first statement on this particular matter. Ratification, in short, did not merit inclusion in what he had to say at the Continental uh, Congress or, in fact, uh, to, to all of those states that were writing Congress for advice. This is, this is the whole sum of, of what Adam supposedly says. Now, I say this is the whole sum of what he supposedly says because, uh, as you'll notice, uh, the, the date range here is, is quite vast. Um, this is John Adams' claim about what he said in 1775. This particular claim appears in his autobiography. His autobiography isn't written until between 1802 and 1807. Whether or not what Adams is reporting he said at the time is a reflection of what he actually thought in 1775, or instead what he actually thought circa about 1807, I cannot definitively say. I have not been able to find any contemporary evidence that this is exactly what he said in 1775. It is nearly what Adams says he said in 1775. Indeed, it's only some months later, in October of 1775, as Adams continued to press his case, continued to try to convince everybody that they needed to create their own civil governments in each of the colonies that are now becoming states, that the subject of ratification even seems to emerge. And it seems to emerge, according to Adams, in response to a question. <clears throat> so while pressing his case to a number of other members of Congress, Adams says that he has asked, when the convention has fabricated a government, or a constitution rather, how do we know that the people will submit to it? His answer, I think, is really revealing. If there is any doubt of that, the convention may send out their project of the constitution to the people in their several towns, counties, or districts, and the people may make acceptance of their own act. I think it's clear from this particular quote, and again, whether this is Adams in 1775 or Adams in 1807, it's clear from this particular quote that ratification is seen as optional here. It's presented as one option, perhaps among many, something to only be pursued if there are other concerns about a document's legality, if there are other concerns about whether or not it enjoys the support of the people. Several years later, Thomas Jefferson uh, critiques the Virginia Constitution of 1776. And ultimately, he's going to have a lot to say about the Virginia Constitution of 1776 in his notes on the state of Virginia, written between 1781 and 1783, that are not republished in English until uh, a few years after that. This is a portion of Jefferson's notes that he personally deemed so controversial that he tells his French interlocutors, you know, you can basically reprint anything in my notes that you want, except for two things. Please don't reprint what it is that I've said about slavery. Please don't reprint what I've said about the Constitution of Virginia. In this section of the notes, uh, Thomas Jefferson ultimately comes to the conclusion uh, that his state's constitution had been illegitimate. But the fact that it hadn't been ratified wasn't the reason the Virginia Constitution of 1776 was illegitimate. The problem, as Jefferson saw it, was that the document had been drafted by the city legislature. And the issue here was that there hadn't been a special convention. As a result, what the ordinary legislature had created was nothing more than an ordinance, a form of ordinary law that any subsequent legislature could either amend or repeal through regular lawmaking procedures. The solution to this dilemma, according to Jefferson, was not, in fact, to send the existing constitution out to the people for it to be ratified, but rather, he suggests, to call a special convention to draft a new one. The other states, he says, have been of opinion that to render a form of government unalterable, the people must delegate persons with special powers, right? We must call these special conventions. They have accordingly chosen special conventions to form and fix their governments, if doubt remains of the validity of the ordinance of government, is it not better to remove that doubt by placing it on a bottom which none will dispute? If they be right, we shall only have the unnecessary trouble of meeting once in convention. Jefferson's hopes for a new constitution ultimately don't come to pass in his lifetime. Virginia continues on with a constitution that he claims is legally deficient. Jefferson believes, as he had argued in the notes, that the acquiescence of the people, especially to a, a kind of hastily cobbled together document that was, that was put together uh, in the middle of a war, 
could not be legitimate. The, the suffrage of people continuing to live under the Virginia Constitution of 1776 and up, rising up and overthrowing it was not evidence enough of its legitimacy that these special conventions needed to be called. And he has a number of other things that he wants to change about the Virginia Constitution uh, as well. Whether we agree with sort of Jefferson or, or not in his perspective, the people of Virginia seem to disagree, or at least enough of the people of Virginia seem to disagree, right? That constitution that he complains uh, so dearly about in the notes continues in place until 1830. It's not until 1830 that the Virginians write a new constitution, and that constitution is actually that. Adams and Jefferson's thoughts on ratification, or rather ratification seeming irrelevant to the question of what made a legitimate constitution, were of course voiced before the federal convention met in Philadelphia in 1787, before ratification was supposedly cemented as this practice above all others to be followed when adopting American constitutions. But the experience with ratification at the federal level seems to have had little to no impact on subsequent developments in the states. The drafting of the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1790 uh, constitutes I think, a really great case study for a couple of different reasons. First, Pennsylvania is one of the most populous and significant states in the United States circa 1790, and a number of extremely important figures are involved, um, including most famously uh, James Wilson. Additionally, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania writ, writ large are under a great deal of scrutiny because of Pennsylvania's uh, position in, 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 in the nation. And this constitutional convention in, in Pennsylvania in 1789-90 is happening right on the heels of the experience of the ratification of, of the federal constitution. So what happens here? As I suggested, James Wilson turns out to be in the middle of all of this. He played a central role at the Federal Constitutional Convention, certainly in Philadelphia in 1787. And then, of course, just a few years later, he is also like the central figure at the Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention in 1789 and 90. Tellingly, the Pennsylvania Convention rejected this supposedly emerging model of ratifying its constitution, right? They rejected the model that supposedly Massachusetts and New Hampshire and the federal constitution had established because it did not seek formal ratification. The convention was instead merely directed to meet, to draft a convention, then to adjourn for some lengthy period of time during which they would publish their amendments and alterations for the consideration of the people, and then they would reconvene and declare their work done. And that's in fact exactly what actually happens in Pennsylvania over this basically year-long period. The convention convenes in November of 1789. It adjourns in February of 1790 with a draft of the Constitution. That Constitution is circulated among the people of Pennsylvania. Then the convention reconvenes in August of 1790, and then just a month later, at the beginning of September in 1790, they declare their work done. Whatever we may think about this kind of process that takes place in Pennsylvania, and I, one scholar has sort of suggested that we might think of it as informal submission to the people, I would argue that it falls far short of what we think of when we think of ratification, right? Simply sort of circulating a document and then like encouraging these delegates to go out and kind of ask people what they think about, right? That's not the same thing as actually taking a vote on this particular topic. What's more, there does not appear to have been any further discussion or debate of this process. Not at the, the Constitutional Convention uh, that meets in Pennsylvania at the time. Uh, the subject is not even raised in the proceedings, let alone debated. Wilson himself, moreover, later given the opportunity to publicly interrogate what makes a legitimate constitution later that same year, uh, when he begins delivering his famous law lectures at the College of Philadelphia, seems to have made relatively little of ratification. The sole legitimate principle of obedience to human laws, he wrote, is human consent. This consent may be authenticated in different ways in its different stages of existence and may assume different names. Approbation, ratification, experience, but in all its different shapes, under all its different appellations, it may easily be resolved into this proposition, simple, natural, and just. All human laws should be founded on the consent of those who obey them. And then he continues in the next paragraph. In that law, we shall find the stream of authority running in the direction of the principle of consent. Consent given originally, consent given in the form of ratification, 
And what is most satisfactory of all? Consent given after long, approved, and uninterrupted experience. So I would point out here that what exactly Wilson even means by ratification is a little bit unclear in, in this context. But Wilson's point throughout, right, is that consent is absolutely central. But the precise form that consent took was immaterial. Ratification, whatever it meant, was not necessarily seen as the essential mechanism for manifesting consent. In fact, I think as the second quote really suggests, Wilson thought experience, which you know, I think we can, we can take to mean a long acquiescence uh, or assent, to be superior to any kind of momentary bounded act like ratification. Meanwhile, Albert Gallatin, someone on, on the opposite end of the political spectrum, I think, whose first case of elected office was in fact his service at this convention uh, in Pennsylvania in 1789-90, seems to agree. Reflecting nearly 50 years later on those proceedings, he concluded that ratification had been entirely unnecessary, at least in this particular instance. The points of difference were almost exclusively on general and abstract propositions, he said. There was less prejudice and more sincerity in the discussions than usual, and throughout a desire to conciliate. The consequence was that, though not formally submitted to the ratification of the people, no public act was ever more universally approved than the Constitution of Pennsylvania of 1790. So even as ratification is being resurrected, is being redeployed in state constitutions, Gallatin's observations, I think, reflect a much older understanding about how constitutional consent might be acquired and then conveyed. Ratification was merely incidental. Its absence, while perhaps worth mentioning, as he does here, had no bearing on the Constitution's legitimacy. Given the standard narrative that dominates the scholarly literature, testimony like this from some of the leading political and constitutional actors of the early Republic, I think is truly remarkable. Now, not long after Wilson and Galton's convention approved its own work without submitting the Constitution they drafted to the people for a vote, Connecticut lawyer and politician Zephaniah Swift made the irrelevance of ratification even more plain. He did so in his attempt to explain the peculiar situation of his state. Zephaniah Swift hailed from Connecticut, and Connecticut, like Rhode Island, had not adopted a new constitution either during or after the American Revolution. Instead, both states preferred to continue operating under their colonial charters, which dated to the 17th century. In a system of the laws of the state of Connecticut, the first law treatise published in the United States, Swift defended his state's course of action. The Constitution of Connecticut, this is the opening lines of this, of this treatise, the Constitution of Connecticut is a representative democracy. Some visionary theorists, and believe me, I would love to know who he's talking about here, some visionary theorists have presented that we have no constitution because it has not been reduced to writing and ratified by the people. It is therefore necessary to trace the constitution of our government to its origins for the purpose of showing its existence, that it has been accepted and known and precisely founded. Such testimony shouldn't exist in 1795, let alone from such an influential legal theorist whose treatise would become widely read in the United States. And yet here it is, capturing an attitude toward constitutional legitimacy that in fact did not die in the 1780s, as scores have suggested, but instead endured long into the 19th century. The Federal Constitution of 1787, I think, towers over our landscape. It blots out so much that surrounds it. That's easy to understand. But we should not discount the importance of the, the federal ratification. I, I don't mean to, to pretend as though this isn't sort of a monumental idea and practice. It was vital. But it did not embody a new consensus around what was needed to make a constitution, any constitution, legitimate. And this cannot, I think, be emphasized enough. Americans did not stop their process of constitution making in 1788. It continued apace in the states, both old and new. And throughout this process, across several decades, not only was ratification not regarded as the essential procedure by which constitutions earned their legitimacy, it was all but ignored. 
If one just looks at state constitution making from roughly 1790 to 1820, one would assume that ratification didn't even exist as an available idea. Indeed, one would think that the founding generation's supposedly signature contribution to constitutionalism was of no enduring importance to that very generation. Thank you. I'll just, I'll, I'll kind of come around here. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, okay. Maybe. Um, I don't think you touched on this, and I'm sorry if I disturbed you, but um, why was there a shift in to ratification being the norm? Yes, I, I was yes, hoping I was hoping you all wouldn't wouldn't notice. Uh, no, the, 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 obviously, the, the title of the talk promised you something on on, on its return, uh, and, and I, I have to be honest, I didn't I didn't make good uh, on on that particular promise. Um, the the short answer is. I haven't had enough time to do enough work to try to figure this out. Um, I do know some things about you know, the moments in which it sort of maybe, maybe we might think of slow and most contested. Um, if we go back to the slide that shows at the very beginning. All right. Uh, you know, for instance, um, I know that there was a fight over ratification in Mississippi in 1836, right? Um, and I know that there is a fight about ratification in Virginia in 1830. Um, so, you know, what I said about like ratification not even being discussed at these conventions, that holds true, I think, for the most part, through at least the end of the 18th century and probably into a little bit of the 19th century. But clearly, at some point, talk of ratification gets reactivated. Figuring out what's going on there um, is, is maybe the subject of, of kind of you know the, the next sort of stage. There's a ton of work that I still have to do on this stuff, uh, but is 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 kind of in, in the next uh, phase. And I, I will say, I one of the things that is challenging about trying to write about state constitutions is just in some cases how hard it is to find the text of them themselves sometimes. It's really hard to get your hands on the New Hampshire Constitution of 1784. Um, some of them are easy to find, you can Google them, um, but figuring out kind of what the processes and procedures, some of them have minutes, have proceeds, like in Pennsylvania in 1790, like there's like a little booklet that, that is minutes from that, that constitution convention, many of them don't. So trying to piece together what happened is going to require probably you to spend some time with some newspapers in, in some instances. Um, and in other instances, like I said, it, it, it's just that work kind of remains to be seen. And I'm very curious if, if, if you guys like listening to this presentation, if, if 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 light bulbs go off and you have kind of an idea of what you think might be happening, I am all ears um, for for I, trying I to. Have any idea. Okay, perfect. <laughs> well, we talk about it later. But okay. I mean, just uh, just want to look at this. I mean, just well, it's other oh, worlds, well, and then checks on it. Yeah. Right? I mean, in other words, in other words, that's the points where some of the people you mentioned as being against it in the 1790s, you know, those are the people who were like, who were like arch villains to, to the Democratic yes. Republic. I mean, Gallatin only sort of merged that way right. uh, because the faction he ends up taking right. uh, over the long term and, and getting Pennsylvania. He's like, I swear, he's like, he's like the, the foreign, double, <laughs> foreign double of aristocracy. Uh, if you had, and he's, I, I can actually list some of the visionary theorists he's talking about. Because I was there, awesome. I was there blind list. that there was no constitution. Oh, there. oh yeah, and he did. It's a colonial charter. It, you know, I mean, you know, it's 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 like in the sign from the king. So that's like, you know, that's a very interesting. And the fact that he's had to start out with his representative democracy. I mean, it's like, it's, it's so. I mean, that's one thing that's, that strikes that. That that's one thing that could. That there's some point at which getting the popular vote becomes something they can't do without. And, and, and the arguments about it may have to really do with that. I will say one of the weird things that I've learned about Mississippi in 1832, and this comes from this great 1960s Journal of Southern History article called you know, The Constitution of right. Mississippi in 1832, um, is that the suggestion there is that it's actually. The liberals, it's the reformers who oppose ratification in Mississippi because they're worried that their new document is going to go down with the feet. And that it's yeah. the conservatives 
who are pushing ratification because they think that you know, so it's almost like ratification becomes a kind of a political ploy to try to defeat. Now we can say instead of now, I guess it's more popular to say popular groups, yeah. you know, some kind of populist principle that gets involved, which uh, in our terms would be liberal and conservative or reaction or whatever, just whatever they, they think it's necessary in advantageous to get to get a mass vote to some kind of improve it. And then you get some of these things here, you know, they're obviously Kansas 1859. Right. And that's a big one. Yeah. Like shooting over who was gonna vote, who was gonna vote, and then of course whether the vote was gonna be accepted. And I think there's some of those like so I don't know, it just it seems like there's a point where where, where democracy or the, the populist principles can kind of get involved. And including the John Adams thing. Mm -hmm. In John Adams 1807, remember that's when John Quincy was becoming a Republican because they actually <laughs> Adams just had decided they would support Jefferson's Mardo. And, and John Quincy Adams was putting himself on a train to uh, be like a Democratic Republican uh, cabinet member and diplomat and, and president. And his dad was right there helping. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 so, so uh, you know, I didn't actually know that. I mean, it's all, by the way, it's all like incredibly hey. interesting because like there's many telling bits, like the fact that John Adams. And it's so ironic, though, isn't it, that Burton Wood and all these people we know, all these grand revolutionary historians are taking John Adams' 1807 awesome. Jeffersonian, you know, sort of crypto Jeffersonian uh, 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 reinterpretation of ratification and then and then uh, adopting it as the thing that literally, I mean, that's like Galen's constitution, right? I mean, that's, that's heard that so many times said that, that all that stuff. Uh, so many times. Um, but the other thing I was going to say, so the one, but then the other one, you know, you could also see ratification originally. It, it seems like it happens in places where there are, if you wanted to not take a democratic line, you, you could say it's more like something that might happen like, like a treaty. You know, like having the member nations have to agree to a treaty. So in Massachusetts, imagine that's the town, right? Because as you point out, that's not. Oh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the town, the towns were where you know it wouldn't be sort of mass individual votes. It would be these stuff, you know, the thing that was a little basic unit mm -hmm. of governance in Massachusetts that probably also thought they were doing stuff up and had to be gone around and get and gotten their, their corporate agreement. Uh, in a way, in, in some way, and, and, and a lot of these others, and it doesn't quite come up in that same way. Well, I think, yeah, uh, like and, except for the people that are going to lose the vote, like the Pennsylvania 1790, they were probably quite afraid that it was going to that it was going to be mass democracy break out again, and they lose. Yeah, and there is sometimes the suggestion of 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 those who who mention that the gravitation disappears for a period of time. Um, usually, they they mention it for a couple of paragraphs and then kind of move on. And most of the time, their focus is these revolutionary era constitutions and not on kind of what happens for a much longer period after the example of the federal constitution. Obviously, it's like I think there are, you can ask real questions, and, and, and certainly other scholars, like Pauline Mayer spends a lot of time talking about how fudgy the results in Massachusetts yeah. are, right? So, like these questions about, like, should we even consider what happens in Massachusetts and New Hampshire as gravitation for towns? Should we really consider that ratification or no? And I'm I, I'm not dogmatic on that. I don't I don't have a dog in a fight. But for the fact that that narrative has 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 become I think so overwhelming, so powerful that in fact that was ratification that introduced the concept and this and this notion that there is that there is 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 explicit borrowing or appropriation. Um, on the part of the delegates to the federal convention from this previous state example. And I just, I don't see that at all. Like, they're not talking about, oh, what happened in Massachusetts? We should definitely recreate that. Like, that just does not seem to Ladies be. Ladies and gentlemen, this is news. <laughs> this is news. I didn't even realize that. They don't talk, they don't talk about it. As far as I can tell, I. says, like, you know, well, they had some good ideas in Massachusetts. Well, and and, and it's, the, it's the Virginians in the Virginian plan who, who come with a plan for ratification. I mean, it's introduced June 5th, and they discuss it, but but at no point, at least from the, the records that we have, and we don't just have Madison's notes, we have a few other convention notes, 
But there just isn't any suggestion that people are talking about what happened in Massachusetts or New Hampshire as part of their, their understanding of, of why gravitation is necessary in this, in this instance. Mm -hmm. Well, I have other ones. Let's go somewhere else. Then. I think Rosie had her hand a second, and then we can go to Justin and then Nelson. I guess uh, my question is more of a clarification one. Uh, would classification on um, convention be only two mechanisms by which? Um, I guess all of the other ones in white cost. Yeah, this, um, well, all of the other ones in 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 white, um, I believe, have special conventions. Um, I mean, certainly that I you know I know that that's what happens in Missouri. There's a special you know people get to elect delegates to the Constitutional Convention in Missouri, and it is that it is that special convention that produces the Missouri Constitution. Um, and I think that happens in all of these other places. Um, I should also point out that there's another weird kind of detailed story about sort of Vermont, Vermont's history. Vermont doesn't officially become part of the United States until 1793, but it had two constitutions prior to the 1793 Constitution. And it seems like mainly, I, I think that the 1786 Vermont Republic uh, Constitution, I think it might be that. Um, so it does seem as though, you know, what Adams and Jefferson are so obsessed with in the 1770s and 1780s, which is the special convention. That really does become the thing. That becomes actually the thing that we think ratification maybe is. And in the way that another of the stories kind of narrate the story, I think what has happened, like this is definitely true in creation of the American Republic. Most of the chapter that Wood talks about ratification in, in, in creation, most of it is about special conventions. Most of the chapter is about special conventions. And then at the very tail end of the chapter, he spends a couple of paragraphs talking about ratification and then uses a couple of really vague pronouns. He keeps saying it, 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 it. And the implication, I think, when you read it, is he's talking about both special conventions and ratification. If possible, way back when creation was written, there was some kind of separation in, in Wood's mind. But then by the time he's writing Liberty and Power, if there was ever a separation between those two things, it's it's disappeared, right? It, 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 they have become fused as kind of like this 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 process that you know that the Massachusetts model is not just ratification. The Massachusetts model is a special convention, and the special convention part is, is probably true. Um, the ratification part obviously seems seems not true. Okay, uh, uh, Nelson, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I mean, you just touched on exactly one of the things I wanted to talk about. So when you talk about Jefferson in Virginia, you, you make this distinction. And I just didn't even realize that I was just holding the two into each other, the special convention and the ratification thing. But if, it, if it's not going, if the Constitution's not going to do anything else, it's not going to go out to the people to be ratified, is it going to go back to the state legislature? Or does the convention have plenty of potentiary power to just adopt the Constitution and it's imposed? I mean, or does Jefferson never address that question? Or does nobody ever address that question? I think Jefferson shares a little bit. Um, obviously, for the purposes of the presentation, I, 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 you know, I can kind of gloss over some kind of subtle distinctions. And I do think that there, there are some real distinctions here to be made between um, some of these thinkers and, and kind of what they're saying. I think it is sometimes unclear also when Jefferson talks in the notes, and then uh, he and Madison both talk about this in a number of letters. Um, and actually, I think a speech that you sent to Jonathan, I was, I was looking at um, not so long ago. Um, I think there's an instance in which they're occasionally saying the word ratification, and it's not at all clear in, I think, my mind, or I think probably in theirs, what the difference is between like ratification, like we think of it, a vote is the people versus ratification meaning like the way a treaty is ratified right a treaty is just ratified by an existing legislative body or by a special body in the notes it's it seems to me that what jefferson is saying is we need the special body it's not altogether clear what he's saying is we need a special body and look it could the special body could just meet and say grace over this thing and then it would be legitimate I think more likely, given everything that Jefferson wanted to change about the Virginia Constitution of 1776, he's saying, let's call it a real um, special convention and, and, and rip up the Constitution that, that we created in 1776 and write something new altogether. But he's a little bit difficult, I, I think, to pin down on, on some of these things, too. And I think 
I, I alluded to this in, in talking about the difficulty of even figuring out, are they writing a constitution or are they just making amendments? Or when they say ratification, what do they mean by that, right? I think this is part of this broad story of these terms and the meaning of these terms is getting worked out alongside these various sort of processes. And so sometimes when we go back and we read what it is that they have to say, I feel sometimes a little bit at sea, and I, I, I try to reflect that here and there in the presentation, I feel a little bit at sea sometimes of exactly what you mean. Like when Wilson says ratification in his law lectures, does he actually mean like ratification? They've just lived through ratification, so maybe he means ratification. Or maybe he means ratification to, to imply a slightly different process um, than, than the one we so, think of when we think of that word. Um, so there's, I think there is some, some difficulty. That probably didn't answer your question. Um, nope. But you know so much more about sure. Virginia. At, you know so much more about Jefferson and Madison and what they have to say, I feel like, on these subjects that I'm looking forward to picking your brain on this. Uh, well, well, we can talk about that. But um, the other part about this is really interesting to me is, so you, you, so the, you pose the question, why did we not get the narrative right? Or why, why the false history? And it's a classic example of how the winner gets to write the narrative back in time and, and the thing that was proposed that won out gets seen as dominant. I mean, at least in two ways. And one of those is democratization and the other is the story of legitimacy, right? Mm -hmm. But what about a third one concerning judicial review? Mm -hmm. Because um, Hamilton describes judicial review in Federalist Number 78 as the judges choosing the, con the will of the people as manifest in the Constitution over the will of a legislative body, okay? And so all of these things are inseparably linked to each other, okay? Popular ratification, special convention, popular ratification, then the role of the judge to do this, to do this dramatically undemocratic act in the name of the will of the people, okay? I'm, I'm just wondering if, so, so we've adopted that practice, is that another reason why we are blocked from the complexity and reality of the, of the history. Yeah, I think that there's a, I mean, I do think that there's a way in which it's easy to misunderstand, I think, what Wilson is saying, and, and, and you know, for moderators to go back and read Swift is really confusing, right? I mean, he's saying we totally have a constitution, it doesn't have to be written, and it was totally ratified by the people, even though it wasn't ratified, but I mean, like, 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 Obviously, like what's going on in his mind um, is, I think, quite different. And and this is where I do think that there is quite a bit of daylight between, like, probably Wilson and Swift on this question, because I think for them, they truly think that like people continuing to live under constitutions for some period of time is not only a form of consent; it's maybe the best form of consent, right? And this is you know this older kind of British model. Jefferson is at least in the 1780s, obsessed with the idea that, no, you need some kind of discrete act. And I think we all are, you know, inheritors of that vision, that understanding. And this is something, you know, there are a handful of scholars, as I mentioned, who have, you know, mentioned this, or they've talked about the fact that so many of the state constitutions, the earliest ones, were not ratified. And Don Lutz has written a little bit about this, and Christian Fitz, Fitz's um, American Sovereigns is, is really good on this. Um, talking about how consent was conceptualized in this kind of revolutionary moment. But in both of those works, the focus really is on those first constitutions. They mentioned that ratification falls out of practice after New Hampshire and the federal constitution. But it's almost like they say it and then they kind of move right off, right? In, 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 in Christian Fritz's his work, um, where he talks about this is on a chapter called Revolutionary Constitutions, right? And it's all about the first constitutions. I think what has happened is they, they I think, have missed this, this kind of broader, longer story of this older way of thinking about consent carrying into the 19th century for a pretty considerable period of time. Like, this wasn't some kind of fringe, weird idea. It was, in fact, something with um, a tremendous amount of power. Okay, uh, uh, Jeff, you have a just, just was annoyed that Justin uh, uh, barely behind Yeah, I, I think you kind of answered my question, what you were just talking about, was thinking about consent and ratification. And so I'll just give you a thought. Yeah. So that you were, you were already answering, and then I'll switch to consent. <laughs> but uh, the thought was just the relationship between consent and ratification, what ratification meant at the time, and whether 
long established custom gives itself consent, right. and whether a ratification is a discrete moment at which that consent begins, and so whether you could pinpoint a, a point in time in which the people do acquiesce to custom to a new constitution, and that becomes a kind of customary ratification. So that as they're thinking about ratification, uh, a ratification itself is a different form. And one form would be not voting, which is Right. Let's go over there. Right. Not taking pitchforks and we ratified. How many pitchforks is it take? Say don't consent. Right. Yes. Yeah. The political science question was about John Nyan's work. Have you seen? I have not. He said this book called um, The American State Constitutional Tradition. Oh. And um, you had mentioned that political scientists did a better job of studying discrete state constitutions. And I, was, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, whether he does a better job with this story or not. Yeah, uh, mostly I was thinking there's a guy named Albert Strum uh, who wrote, uh, there's a number of different articles that have been cited by a lot of, to the extent that the historians engage in this stuff at all, they all cite, it's like this work from sort of the middle of the 20th century. Um, so like, you know, I mean, there, there is, I think, still an investment in, 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 in telling sort of stories for constitution writing. What is different almost always about this work, and actually I do think, is that book outside of your office on the book? I think I have grabbed it, I just didn't recognize the, the name, and this is what happens. This is this is what happens when you when you know when, when you're no longer in history brain with history names, um, you don't necessarily uh, latch on uh, to those other names. What is always true certainly of of of, of these sort of political science works uh, tends to be the the but rather than just focusing on sort of like one period, they tend to be like these these, these long histories. So that you know, in one breath they're talking about the, the colonial era, and then the next breath they're talking about Jim Crow. Um, and and so sometimes it can be hard to get them to kind of dwell for any length of time on uh, one particular subject. Um, I, I will say um, Jefferson in the in the portion of the notes uh, that is really close to the quote that I shared with you. Um, Jefferson goes on at some length, uh, basically trying to refute this claim. You know, it's kind of like some people will say that the people of Virginia have assented to this document, so therefore it's legitimate. And he says, "This is ridiculous. We were in the middle of a war, and uh, it was this, you know hastily thrown together document, and 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 it, it is it is preposterous to think that people could consent. And like, what do you want to do? Rise up in rebellion? Like, I mean, it, 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 it's Jefferson rhetorically attempting to kind of swat down." The, the Swifts of the world, right? The Wilsons of the world. Um, but it's not altogether clear to me how much, you know, this 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 brief moment where Madison and Jefferson both are so interested in, in, in a new constitution for the state of Virginia is relatively short lived. And some people, I think, would say that, you know, everybody's focus and attention just turns to the federal constitution, and the federal constitution in some ways solves some of the problems with the states. Um, but they lose interest in that project, right? I, Jefferson goes to France, I think, and, and Patrick Henry refuses to sign on to uh, rewriting uh, the Constitution of Virginia, and so basically like the, the idea, the fantasy just dies. So to the extent that you find Jefferson and Madison talking about this, it's like this conversation seems to basically stop uh, by about 1785, 86, um, never seemingly really to be revived again. And so when Jefferson dies before Virginia gets a new constitution, Madison is at the Constitutional Convention for Virginia in 1830, but he speaks in a whisper, um, according to the, the documentary history, right? So he's he's an aged state, statesman who basically is saying nothing. And by this point, he thinks on the Virginia Constitution, they say, you know, sort of gone, right? right? Um, so his own views on what is needed for a constitution uh, might have you know, kind of softened. <laughs> yeah, very consent today with the idea that our constitution has been amended 27 times, right. but it's changed very dramatically over our history. And those dramatic changes have come about through judicial interpretation or whatever else it might be. And those are legitimate to the right. uh, rather than setting it back to the breath. Yes. If you don't get out those pitchforks, then you're just going to have to live with it, right? I, and that, and that, yeah, yeah, I think this, this idea that. that I, and, and certainly, you know, the, the I think that it's kind of usually a lazy retort, but just sort of, you know, if you don't like it, pass a constitutional amendment. You know, it's like that. That um, there, there's a reason we think we think in that way, right? Um, and, I, and 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 so yeah, I, I, 
to the extent that the story that I'm telling maybe peters out in the 1830s, I think you're suggesting, no, no, maybe maybe, maybe there are elements of it that are, that are in fact still with us. I don't think it peters out at all. I think it's those reds all kinds of different shenanigans. Yes. Well, what happens in Rhode Island is obviously a whole story yeah, right, into itself. Yeah, itself. And they're, yeah. they're, you can see not just this work. Yes. And, uh, Bailey. Yeah, I wanted to circle back to your survey. Um, yeah. I'm wondering how this research is going to affect the way that you're teaching your survey, yeah. as right. well as the way that like students are engaging with this period, as well as like, ratification as a principle of American Constitution. That's a good question. And it, it's really, you know, nothing takes on so much the ring of truth as something that you have said over and over and over again. And you come to believe it. I mean, I'm sure classroom teachers know this too. It's like you come to believe it with a kind of like bone deep certainty. Like you know it's true because you have you have proclaimed it in front of like a captive audience for all of these years. And so how do you change? And like the first inclination is usually to make like these like tiny tinkers. It's like, okay, well, I just won't say that one sentence. Or I just won't, you know, like because because it's like, oh, who wants to upset the apple cart, right? Who wants to kind of rewrite the story? Um, I think that kind of remains uh, to, to be seen a little bit for me. Um, some of this obviously is 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 the additional work uh, that, that I think still still really kind of needs to be done. Um, but I, I, I do think it's interesting, you know, like, what will I say about that? I, I, I suppose I could just kind of bracket the entire conversation about ratification in Massachusetts and kind of, you know, yada, 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 uh, some, some, some things. Um, because otherwise, I think it does have, it, it, it not only changes the way we tell the story of state constitutional development, it, it changes the story that we tell about what happens um, with federal ratification, which is, that's the thing that everybody talks about, right? Um, and I, and I think it's, you know, I, I was always told when I was preparing my lectures for the first time, you assign your second favorite textbook and you uh, make your lectures from your first favorite textbook. Uh, and my first favorite textbook was Liberty, Equality, Power. And, that, and there's like a reason why I told this, like how this got like implanted in my brain um, in, in particular. Um, and it's ironic that like the textbook that actually goes into this you know, just to get it wrong as opposed to the text, all the textbooks that just kind of float on by. They're like state constitutions wrote some states wrote some constitutions at the end. Like they, they just breeze on on past that particular period. It's the ones who dwell on it. Who yeah. I miss 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 lead us. Uh not not through any ill intent, I think. Oh, see, and the rest of us don't have to change it until we Yes, I figured out. Yes. <laughs> 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 Uh, let me say before, let's, we'll go to Jay, but uh, people can't ask questions online, uh, and I have figured out how to see them. Uh, every time I pull my phone, I can do it. The cameras will go to doing something to look at my phone. Uh, <laughs> like, why is the guy, he's like, he's like, he's like sharing the session, he's like, look at his phone. Uh, and I'm looking at YouTube and Facebook for any questions that I've never really seen. Either. So if there's any last questions people have on the internet, you know, get them in now and, and they'll show them the thing on the uh, uh, And I also want to say that uh, we will end, well, if this is Jay's the last question, it's probably when we'll stop, but there is a little reception outside here, but some, uh, some food, so please come eat this food. Uh, uh, Jay. Oh, I didn't know it was the last question, but well, I, I let me be the first to say what a wonderful paper this was. <laughs> <laughs> Just fantastic. A little thing and then a thought about the shadow of the survey, of course, and maybe that that's the problem here. But the little thing is, I think you made the case that Massachusetts should be in white, not in red. Like, I'm totally down with that if you want to change the color coding there. Um, but then this thing about, oh, the transition from white to red and, and all that, is that only problematic if we look at this through the lens of the familiar U.S. narrative and the survey courts? Whereas if we were, and I'm looking at Rosie now to correct me if I'm wrong, but we, we just got done teaching Linda Colley's Global History of Constitutions book. Um, I was, I guess I'm ignorant, I should reveal this, but I was surprised to learn that the most constitutions in the period from 1780 to 1820 by far uh, were found in Europe and they were imposed by France, uh, Imperial Napoleonic France, none of which, of course, were ratified there at all, just like it, you see ratification even in a more liberal democratic political system in North America aren't being ratified. But then when you get into the mid, late 19th century, that's, and I just did a search on 
Apocrypha. That's when ratification starts to appear in the text. So that actually it's only a problem or a mystery because we viewed this in an early national sense. But if we actually think about it chronologically, we think about systems of Atlantic exchange, there's no problem at all. It makes perfect sense. It's following a very similar rhythm and, and pattern of, of development in the United States as it is elsewhere. I've been uh, waiting for this sort of international uh, constitutional uh, question. I don't have a good answer to it, but I, it was something that I, I, I spent a little time. It was like the moment while present, preparing this presentation where I thought, I don't even know stuff that happened in some of these states. I, I'm pretty sure I, I shouldn't start trying to figure out what happened in Colombia, circa. Yeah. Uh, and, but in addition to the, the uh, European context, as I, as I I think just alluded, right? I mean, there's you know this, this tremendous sort of period of uh, Latin American constitution writing that I truly do not know much of anything about. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested to try to learn more about is whether or not it makes any difference if these nations have federal constitutions like ours or our national constitutions. That you know, one of the things that I'm floating here about our federal constitution is that it had to be ratified because it was federal, because there were already extant states. And you can't just usurp power, you, you, you've got to seek consent um, from those pre existing governmental bodies. But what happens in, in nations where there are no pre existing states, where there just is a national constitution? I don't know. Um, and I, I would be very interested to see because my, my understanding. Is that some of the Latin American constitutions are ratified, but I don't know starting when. Um, so that is also going to be something that I need to figure out a lot about, and maybe Robert can help me. <laughs> uh, and so global history of ratification. Right. So I love how this project that's is just saying, right? Right. Roger, yeah, Roger, that's, Roger, that's Roger. Supposed to read. That's yeah. That's yeah. Book read. So uh, this is I mean, I had a very similar question. I was also going to ask about the international context, but less the later period. Uh, what I think is interesting is in the period of the 1790s, mm -hmm. this is when we're getting French constitutional ratification. And so I'm wondering if this, I mean, both we might have times where we're following trends, uh, but in the 1790s, maybe actively not doing what the, you know, is happening in a place, especially after the terror. And so I'm just kind of curious if there might be moments too, where both the U.S. is looking like these trends, as Jay has pointed out, and other times where it's actively trying to do something different as a differentiation. Yeah, turning away from the model. And I, I, I have to say, it's like, I, I actually think that probably the most interesting part of the story is the 1790s. Um, and that's not only because of, of, of something I think you alluded to, um, but also uh, the fact that so many, and nobody's asking about this, but, but so many of the, the constitutions that follow into the aughts and the teens are new state constitutions. And uh, right here, there, there is arguably just a totally different understanding of who the people are who are ratifying it, right? That here for new state constitutions, the people who are ratifying it are the people of the United States, not the people of that territory that's about to become a state. And so it is acceptable and it should, we should think of it as having been ratified because Congress votes on it, right? The representatives of the people of the United States have approved those constitutions and so they have been approved by the people. Um, so I think. There is a whole sort of separate story to be, to be told about you know, what's going on in the territories as well. The 1790s, I think, are probably where a lot of my good, exciting action is at. But, it, but I will also say, um, I know for a number of these southern states, um, there are not minutes of the proceedings. So that is also, I think, probably going to be a, a, a difficult um, story to sort of narrate. And in a number of those states, uh, Jefferson be able to help me with this. There are, are, are certainly newspapers, but the print culture is not nearly as vibrant as you're going to find in, in some other places. So, telling that that story of, of the 1790s and what's going on there is 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 going to be a challenge. But I think like a really important, probably the most important part for sort of me as I as I think about next stages. Well, that's it. It's scary that the uh, proceedings of these things are are, are uh, shockingly hard to say. Fine. And, and you said that actually sometimes they're mid. I, I actually thought they were at least minutes uh, because what I was shocked is like people love the like, constitutional debates, right. and right. there's none of that for a lot of these, just minutes. And that's literally just like you know, they voted on this, right. they picked a doorkeeper. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Missouri, the none Missouri, of the stuff you care about, right? Missouri <laughs> at 1821, or 18, 18, oh, uh, well, 1820. 
it's like there's a, the, all, all, only the dumb stuff. Like nothing, yes. Uh, uh, is actually, is actually nothing you care about, and every you know everything that you're interested in is completely off the table. I do think for Delaware and Mississippi, there's going to be. Some be <laughs> you got to keep the minutes spare so that you don't give away the secrets, right? Unfortunate for historians, but so does. So, uh, anyone else? I didn't see anything coming online. Okay, one more. I was just going to ask if the concept of like a required re-ratification after a certain period of time was ever proposed or discussed. Because I know a lot of the anti-federalist thought among constitutions was about how it would imprison future generations and something they never voted for. And so like Missouri's constitution, you know, every 20 years we actually get to vote on it again. So I was just wondering, Mike, if you have any thoughts on re-ratification. So Jefferson is potentially maybe, you know, sort of trying to suggest like, like his answer to the question, like, how do we make the Virginia Constitution of 1776 legitimate? Is this weird kind of like let's call a convention and then maybe the convention can just say, Yay, it's good. Okay, cool. Uh, and then they can adjourn and it can be a lot again. Um, but I think that um, in a number of these other early state constitutions, uh, and this is you know, most of the ones that are adopted during the revolution, um, one of the other defects of those early constitutions is that often they provide no procedures whatsoever for amending them. Or, for, you know, it's like, like, how do you answer the question, like, who on earth could possibly call back in session a constitutional convention? These constitutions provide no answer. And, and that happens, in fact, like the provision in the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776 is something that's sort of like you can only meet one, one time in a seven year period. And when they convene in 1790, they are ignoring what the Pennsylvania Constitution says they can do in terms of meeting. And so they spend a lot of time at the beginning being like, here are some justifications for why we're doing it's not, you know, as in the federal constitution, it's not a coup. We're, we're totally like this is what the people want is what they you know always the defense is if this is what the sovereign people demand then who are we to say why why should we be so so narrow-minded so loyally as 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 to um as to follow a procedure set out in a constitution that wasn't even you know a, a, a created by a special convention or ratified by the people in the first place um so there are um, increasingly sort of during this period when old states rewrite their constitutions, one of the things that they're cognizant of is that they need to provide some procedure for um, the document itself to be amended. And some of them do include these clauses that say like every so often we can must revisit this particular question. Um, but then, then I think there's a moment where they turn away from that because they realize the, the countervailing argument here is we don't want to be rewriting a constitution every time you turn around that, that Wilson would say that would diminish respect for like the rule of law. Like you, you will you will harm the place of the constitution in the minds of people if you're forever tinkering with it. Um, that you need to give it a chance to kind of solidify uh, and, 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 and attain the approbation of the people um, and, and not just go kind of ripping things up willy nilly. Well, thank you, Amy. <laughs> okay, doing probably before you really wanted to. Uh, it's a very exciting project, but I think it's one of the most exciting new projects that we've heard about here for a while, I thought. So uh, uh, thank you so much, and please cut some food. <laughs> Thank you.